Ah, uh, let's see, lots of things to announce. Um, we've announced this before, but just one more time. These photographs on the back wall and up here, these color prints uh, are by Miriam Berkeley, and they are available for purchase if you are, are interested in um, bringing those home. Um, yep. Yeah, so you can talk to Miriam about pricing and shipping arrangements. Unframed prints in a box. They're not free. You have to talk to Miriam. Yeah. Um, but um, on that back register there by Amy, there's Amy waving beautifully like the queen. Um, that is the departure sheets. For those of you who are flying, and this is your last chance to verify that your information is correct because we're going to take them up after this. Um, and so if you're, you, you may not want that wake up call. Um, so double check that. Um, this evening, after Richard Bausch's reading, we have our dance, the second dance at the pub with the, uh, with the band, so we'll keep you up really late and make you really tired before you travel tomorrow. Um, and I think, hopefully, everybody's familiar with the departure procedures at the end tomorrow morning. And, yep, that, yep, 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 oh, right. Wyatt Pronti. <laughs> What am I to do with this? <laughs> oh. Andrew, did you do no. this? Nope. <laughs> I just asked if I was safe coming up here and I was okay. I'll use it later. <laughs> You know, the laughter's telling. <laughs> Gosh. All right. Can happen to other people, too, you know. <laughs> uh, I would like to tell you, I think we're at $1,600 for the uh, waiters and kitchen staff, so congratulations on that. And I also just want to mention uh, Kaki Wilkinson, Juliana Gray, and Erica Dawson, who have been here uh, many years and in some different ways are moving uh, on to other things. Kaki's going to a competing college, boo. Uh, <laughs> and Juliana and Erica have just become so senior and distinguished that uh, they're going to stop serving drinks. <laughs> uh, uh, also, I would say that um, something, uh, when this writers' conference began, um, it, it owes a great deal to Tennessee Williams. It owes some of the impetus for its start. But we didn't have money then from Tennessee Williams. All of his income was tied up with his estate still and the support of his sister and various other things. That came in time. The way we started was I called various people and said, what do you think about this? That was in July of 1989. And um, I, I'll always remember that Tim O'Brien said, yeah, it's a great idea. I never asked what he would be paid and didn't find out until the end of the conference. Um, that, was, that kind of generosity characterized uh, the people who signed up in the beginning. And uh, I think that has continued all the way through. I think this has been a particularly um, fine gathering. And uh, so when you people... If you've had a good time, if you haven't, I don't want to hear. If you've had, if you, if you had a good time, you might uh, turn and thank each other because it's a collective effort, and it goes on from year to year. It's the way we make art. It's the way we make this gathering. So thanks to you. Now, let's see. This is a short little poem. Incident in the Sublime. From the bluff, the world below looks miniature. But by what scale is something miniature? A few brown fields bordered by evergreens, 
Once in Montana, a small girl slipped at the edge of a prospect and a man walking behind her, lost in some worry, reached without thinking and caught her pumping arms. The mother was speechless, then grateful, but the man kept walking. Hours later, stopping farther up that mountain road, he stood a long time on a different ledge, not wondering at the inexhaustible bearstat or coal whose river meandered below, and not at the turner, miles away, building the bruised fist of a thunderstorm, but at the immediate, upraised, yet impersonal arms of a six-year-old whose need could frame the entire list of it. And this, for the noise of it, which I have read before, but I will read again. It's entitled, Two Views. <clears throat> One, into the laterals and faults of strata, whose linear seams are like memory, water wades its way settling matters in small aquifers, incised meanders, then floods over a landscape that teaches plains are only so much sediment, silt, the slow ocean of any reach. Think travertine and serpentine mantle high in living rooms or cames and tills scattered like loose change, the marvelous marble of dolomite and metamorphic rock or granite, now as coolingly aloof as someday overhead, small seismic self feeling a gust rattle through, rattle years through the roof. Meanwhile, there's still the phone and mail, the door and the reassuring fact the fault's not yours as you've not budged. Not even the cat crosses the floor. Outside, the world's continuum of nests is full of cries announcing differences while mine shaft down the brittle shale of self waits certain of its own circumferences. One is colossus of one's growing doubt with ideas like past presidents profiled in floating enthusiastic shouts from old elections, conclusions of the will, the dehydrations of mere permanence. But high wing overshadow how the world doubles in its transience. Two, resplendently fragile, more color than weight, as agile of flight as of changed habitat, the birds are choric in the fate of their varieties, predictable of habit and Darwinian choices, myriad on one scale and on another essential and of but one and all. And voices, this side liquid whistles followed by a trill, while there a series of clear carolings, then the rapid whinnies of descending will while somewhere overhead a finch attempts all notes at once, as though to summarize the way limbs latter up, step green to blue, so shadows rise. But year on year, wing beat and season, fattened or starved, silent or full of migratory sass, one reason brings each back, whether the same or no, warbler and thrush, sparrow and finch, wren, jay, thrasher and dove, tanager, waxwing, owl, crow, hawk, they light, feed, breed, migrate or stay calendar-wise in their brief histories, and vulnerable as any immigrants searching to eat, they are geographies of days, convergences of now, and needful if for nothing more than, our, than their arrival, when worthy that again we crane to see, they bring survival. Oh, and here's a different sort of poem. <clears throat> It's entitled Another, Tire, Another Christmas Tie This Year. <laughs> I 
I think the only way to break this is to start drinking it. Uh, the first years ago, I was given a big glass of vodka, thought it was water, had a big gulp during the reading, and all I could blurt out was, this water's adulterated. <laughs> and I've been getting adulterated water ever since, and enjoying it a lot of times. <clears throat> this, is, this is something a little different. Another Christmas tie this year, that, and it goes right into the poem. Another Christmas tie this year that is green and red and longer than usual and worn by you over another Christmas dinner where you were smiling down the table and taking stock. You're 65, you've got your health, you've got your job, you like to work. Left and right, your smiling kids are out of school. They've got their health, their jobs, their plans. They say they like to work, they save. And tonight, they are laughing with tears in their eyes. Far end, there's your wife laughing. She is beautiful in ways Jane Fonda never figured out, and so much younger, too, such that the both of you know who time comes will do the tucking in, and she will live on well because she is, well, she is younger than you, and so kind about the things she cannot change, like you. Not that you're not distinguished in your quiet world where you are far too modest ever to wear that rack of medals you deserve, but live instead as though some gray Olympian who likes to give the second second place a second chance. And you are Chamberlain and Russell and Bird and Roland Kirk, Monk, Rubeck and the other Bird and Melville and Hardy enjoying a good laugh on a sunny day. You are the hidden redwood in your side yard's undergrowth, bordering a cul-de-sac of grave reflection, where your neighbors never park their cars quite right. And you do not mind that always you must look down a bit to see these things. No, really, the only worry about your looking down just now might be to find some small spot of something on your brand new tie. Until in order to say grace, hands rising to your lap, you do look down, bowing your head while a grave moment stretches through your family's silence. You look down and see, in fact, there is no spot on your tie, no spot at all, because while sitting down you let the tie sink into the gravy boat where it has settled and lost the long flat bow of holly with red berries it was meant to represent. There it is, stilled and changed above your washed and separate hands, which now you join, saying grace anyway, and meaning it a little more than would have been the case with only a small spot on your tie. Thank you, but I'll save the other one. Okay. From Childhood Summers on a Farm, this is entitled The Combine, and that also rolls right into the poem the title does, The the Combine. Rolled with the grace of a box, swallowing a path across the field, dragging its skyline overhead, till in the distance it became the fix by which the day circled and stayed. The cutting bars and feet are clanked, filling the drum, as the whole thing lurched with every turn, then repeated its way, working the august air in which it ground back and forth, stately and spare, steadily going and going nowhere, but constantly around. The chute exhaled, truck followed slowly, as work meant cutting through one place while running parallel in trace for the yellow wheat funneling lightly. So the grain dust blazed as the low sun burned and the hardwoods stood in silhouette bordering moment to moment where the field waited 
and the combine turned. This is um, we many of us have taken care of older parents. This came from that. It's entitled "Late Walks." <clears throat> Health was a brutally exclusive neighbor with windows overlooking one-way streets where visits were brisk turns about soul topics that either improved or did not, and where hope collected like some prospect of mass mailings or the gloved applause of pigeons lifting. Before she was sick, she said she didn't know what health was anyway, a free mortgage, Carrying what now had grown too heavy, I listened to her list of losses, diminishment sharpened, as sun astringent as the clearing where she drank air, praised light. And I'm going to flip away from my poetry for a minute and read somebody else's. There are um, three poems that I know I've written about Sewanee. Um, Mary Jo has two of them. Uh, in the Guest House, I think, is the more recent one, an earlier one, Midsummer, Georgia Avenue. They're in her, you can select it. I'm plugging her book wherever she, there she is. Um, in 1996, Donald Justice and I were walking in front of Gary Auditorium during the Summer Music Festival here. With, the windows were open, and some student was um, playing the same phrase over and over and Don stopped and he said that that young person is taking uh, a course in composition he's trying to compose something and and I remembered uh, uh, Don had um, originally set out to be a composer he studied composition at the University of Miami with Carl Ruggles and then he moved to Chapel Hill and pursued poetry anyway he he just said that I said yeah I think that sounds right to me and then a little while later, he sent me a draft, or I guess maybe the first, the finished version of this poem. It's entitled At the Young Composer's Concert, Sewanee, Tennessee, Summer 1996. The melancholy of these young composers impresses me. There will be time for joy. Meanwhile, one can't help noticing the boy who bends down to his violin as if to comfort it in its precocious grief. It is his composition, confused and sad, made out of feelings he has not yet had, but only caught some hint or rumor of in the old scores. And that has been enough, merely mechanical, sure, all artifice, but can that matter when it sounds like this? What matters is the beauty of the attempt, the world for him being so far mostly dreamt, not that a lot to tell the truth has passed, nothing to change our lives or that will last, and not that we are awed exactly. Still, there is something to this beyond mere adult skill and if it moves but haltingly down the scales, it is the more moving just because it fails and is the lovelier because we know it has gone beyond itself as great things go. He was one of those early people who joined. And when Mark Jarman wrote me late at night an email to say that Don had died. I sat down and wrote the first draft of this poem. I guess uh, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, in addition to um, composing music and being a fine sight reader, Don taught himself uh, to paint and did watercolors. Um, he was interested in, it turns out, in Chi Chinese watercolors. I saw, I had some sense of that and mentioned it to Nigel Thompson, if you know who he is. 
And about a year later, or maybe a little longer, Nigel sent me an article. He just went all over and unpacked a good bit about that, uh, uh, that interest on Don's part. Uh, there's mention of uh, Guilin in, in China and cormorants, cormorants, I'm sorry, that, that uh, are used by fishermen. They put a ring around their neck and they, they dive down, catch fish, come back up. They can't swallow it, and so the fish are collected that way. The title of this is Prudentius Seneca Boethius, etc. And the first three lines you are, uh, first two lines are fairly okay, I think, translations. Uh, by somebody without any skill at all, me. And, and the third one is sort of smart ass, and I, I really like it. Um, it's also kind of, kind of inaccurate. Uh, <clears throat> Prudentius, Seneca, Boethius, etc., for Donald Justice. So in my 57th year, what use? Time devours all things, and the man who gazes at his shoes loses his glasses. And the music's calling no one back. The sky rains sparrows if you watch it long enough, but justice doesn't, and the music is silent. Sometimes the sky's a wren's egg blue of hope, a Chinese boneless watercolor blue, but then loose sparrows come cluttering and loud. In China, in Guilin, the fishermen set out by dark, Gas lanterns suspended above the bows of narrow boats, floating the black reflective water like brief instances of someone's rule that says it is displacement gives memory its weight. The fishermen use cormorants, necks ringed so what they catch they cannot swallow, cannot in fact but give, if only of displacement. The birds surface, release, then disappear, the bow lights drifting, opening the dark. The boats float out, then one by one come back to where the sky could rain a thousand losses and no one look up, nor hear any music. Justice is gone and no one plays that dark. Listen but the cormorants dive silently. Listen for a long time, but what they do is silent. Only memory can hear. <clears throat> the insistent. Someone is opening tomorrow's show, pitched in the field below, while overhead the peaceful dead look on or not, peace the same, as though receding light might shadow home away to search. All is memory and names by which fixed memory still claims itself in charge. Oh, let that charge be low, here and tomorrow, not memory of loss, but something of a gray-green spring Late children called home, answering. And another early writers' conference poet, Mona Van Dyne. I was talking about her the other day with Mary Jo um, at lunch. Um, and it's this is a poem that applies to what we've been doing for the last twelve days. It's entitled "The Vision Test." And I've read this. I read this several times before Mona, and I and I, I think I believe I read it better than she did. And <laughs> my driver's license is lapsing, and so I appear in a room full of waiting others and get in line. I must master a lighted box of far or near, a highway language of shape, squiggle, and sign. As the quarter hours pass, I watch the lady in charge of the test and think how patient, how slow, how nice she is. A kindly priestess indeed, her large round face, her vanilla pudding, baked apple and spice face and continual smiles as she calls each deer and honey and shows first timers what to see. She enjoys her job. How pleasant to be in her care, 
rather than brute little bureaucrat or sales lady. I imagine her life as a tender placing of hands on her children's hands as they come to grips with the rocks and scissors of the world. The girl before me stands in a glow of good feeling. I take my place at the box. And how are you this lovely morning, dear? A few little questions first. Your name, your age, your profession, poet. What? She didn't hear. Poet, I say loudly. The blank pink page of her face is lifted to me. What? She says. <laughs> Poet, I yell. P-O-E-T. A moment's silence. Poet, she asks. Yes. Her pencil still. She turns away from me to the waiting crowd, tips back her head like a hen drinking clotted milk, and her ha <laughs> of hysterical laughter rings through the room. Again, oh, ha, 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 I told you. People stop chatting. A few titter. It's clear I've told some marvelous joke they don't quite, they didn't quite catch. She resettles her glasses, pulls herself together, pats her waves, the others listen and watch. And what are we going to call the color of your hair? She asks me warily. <laughs> Perhaps it's turned white on the instant. Or green is the color poets declare. Or perhaps I've merely made her distrust her sight. Up to now, it's always been brown. Her pencil trembles. Then, with an almost comically obvious show of reluctance, she lets me look in her box of symbols for normal people who know where they want to go. <laughs> what else? Okay. This is just a little poem. It's entitled Thin. Declaring war on household order, grabbing the apples, oranges, anything, then racing out, we had our ideas of order. And Bill Burke's dad was dead, shaving in the marrow. This was 1955. Everyone else was still alive. What would they have us children do back then? We were very brave and very thin. When night came deepening our windows, we saw it like the lost eyes of dark mirrors. Night came and we were brave to sleep again. Sometimes Burke's mother sang us our names. And this is a poem I read last year. I may read it uh, off and on, maybe every year, I don't know. It's entitled Reading the Map. Uh, Last year it was in celebration of a marriage of 38 years. This year it's in celebration of a marriage of 39 years. You can see why I might keep reading it. Uh, it mentions a couple of things. Brunton Pocket Transit. That's a very fine uh, compass, surveying compass, that uh, geologists use and surveyors and so forth. And also there's some, uh, some geological terms, strike, dip, fault, contact, and foliation. Those are all descriptions of, of the, not of leaves, but of the ground. And I think that's all. Reading the map. Whatever bearing you select, eventually your path will intersect such variance in elevation you will find you need a topographic map for where things lead. Brunton, pocket, transit opened, Orient yourself so compass rows, legend, and coordinates confirm the route you've picked. That done, pack up, set out, following the arguments of contour lines from rock and rise to water and decline to where, in order to be accurate, 
cartography exaggerates. By scale, that bridge your map identifies should be invisible, but there it lies, as bold in print and pixel wide as the hurried river it divides, past which the landscape's slow relief devolves with roll and slip beneath each step you take, following a trail that, in order to be read, is inaccurate to scale. As map and compass make one motion out of strike, dip, fault, contact, and foliation, weaving and woven where roads and bridges are the duplicates of valleys, ridges, every aspect arguing some other, as love intends and maps assume, two put together, even when just one is represented. This road, that bridge, or you, could you be printed? Clearly, standing out of scale, yet there you are, ready for imagination's little car driving a world that turns into whatever confirmations you pass through. A landscape written uppercase and in bold print, like love, and traced even where there is no pixel. Even as reading the map, we know we are invisible. And then, because that sounds entirely too good and decent and sincere of me, uh, I'm going to write an, uh, write, I'm going to read another poem uh, about marriage, uh, not Barbara's in my marriage, written when I was much younger um, and really didn't know a lot at all. And I, looking it over today, I realize that there's, uh, the poem makes the observation that the husband described here is now 50 years old. That seemed significant to me 25 years ago. <laughs> anyway, this is entitled The Actuarial Wife. About their chances for divorce, she says slim, because the one who leaves will have to take the children. <laughs> About their children, she says, we should have waited until they were older to have them. <laughs> but most about her husband smoking. He's 50 now, and taking stock of all they have, she stands outside the blue haze through which he angles down into his favorite easy chair like an accurate punt, perfect hang time to read the morning paper over coffee and start another pack of luckies, stubbed emphatically like punctuation marks down through an urgent argument. She clarifies their options for retirement. Darling, if one of us dies, I'm going to live in Paris. conclude with um, I think I'll just stop with this the first poem in this overpriced book which some of you have been kind enough to buy um, wait, keep waiting for a paperback it's uh, just about a mole and um, it's um, um, perhaps has something to do with what you hope for uh, when you write or when you're not writing and you hope to write again. Mole. For weeks, he's tunneled his intricate need through the root-rich, fibrous, mineral dark, buckling up in zagged illegibles the cuneiforms and cursives of a blind scribe. Sleeved by soft earth, a slow reach knuckling, small tributaries open from his nudge. Mild immigrant, Bland isolationist, berm builder edging the runnelling world. But now the snow, and he's gone quietly deep, nuzzling through a muzzy neighborhood of dead-end street, abandoned cul-de-sac, and a bolt run from a dead run, sorry, and bolt run from a dead leaf roundhouse burrow. 
May he emerge four months from this as before, myopic master of the possible, wise one who understands prudential ground, revisionist of all things green. So when he surfaces, lump-like, bashful, quizzical as the flash bulb blind to wait for color to return, he'll nose our green rich air with the imperative poise of now. Thank you, people.